I've done this my whole life. I'm supposed to play 10 years in the league and make millions. Like, what's up? Yeah. And we just need money. So I apply to Pepsi. I'm like stocking soda and selling it to stores and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I'm going through the store with my Pepsi gear on and people are stopping me. Hey, Bombas didn't get it, you know, and like making a scene and stuff. But I'm like, shit, I got to do what I got to do, you know, to support my family. So I'm doing that. And the money's good. If you if you work overtime and stuff and you're young, like the, the money was was all right. But it was more just, you know, what am I doing? You know? Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Untapped Potential podcast. On today's episode, we're interviewing Michael Bumpus, former NFL wide receiver and Washington State football legend. Michael was an All-American player in high school and held the record for the most receiving yards for a wide receiver during his time at Wazoo. In this episode, we'll talk about his football career, his rough patch after the NFL, and how he built an elite training business from the ground up. You don't want to miss this one. Welcome to the show, Bump. Thanks for having Welcome, me, Michael. fellas. Appreciate the cool glove. You know, oh, yeah. right, we had to. over there. You know, we it was to. really hard trying to find a Bumpus jersey on eBay, man. Like, man. I don't think they sell those anymore. Those, those things, if you see a Bumpus jersey, it's all like the numbers faded now. And the Coog <laughs> is falling off. but The Reebok, yeah. you know, stitching is Russell. still Russell. We had Russell. Oh, you had Russell? Yes. Oh my gosh. Dark times for us wow. jersey wise. Oh man. Wow. You definitely can't find <laughs> it was that bad. anymore. Um I want to talk about how we met actually, because we met I think eight years ago now, something yep. like that. And uh this is still ingrained in my mind. And for me, I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you don't, but for me, um it was like it was just really awkward because I didn't know I knew you. Uh -huh. I just I just haven't met you before, right? And so we met uh, through my good friend, Chris Malgoza, um, and it was at his old apartment complex. And I believe it was Redmond or Bellevue, Washington. Mm -hmm. And you were doing personal training at the time. And uh, you had gotten off of a meeting with a client and you met us up at that complex for, for some reason, like you were in the area. And I remember uh, walking up to you and I was like, oh, shit, like in my, in my head, I was like, oh, shit, that's Michael Bumpus. Um, obviously cause I'm a kook and I, I walked up and I, I try to like, I try to dab you up or something. And right away you knew I, you didn't know me. Right. And uh -huh. so like in that interaction, you're like, who the hell is this guy? Why the hell is he trying to dab me up right now? And I'm like, fuck it. It kind of like, I kind of fumbled the bag on that one. Um, so anyway, I, I just wanted to, uh, clear the air on that. Cause it's been weighing on me for like eight years. <laughs> and well, funny. the way I remember, I don't remember like that. I just remember it just being all good. So. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. All right. <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on the no show, problem. man. And, and you've been doing a lot since, um, since retiring from the NFL, you've been in, in coaching quite a bit, uh, both at a high school level. Um, and also, um, doing ESPN, you have your own podcast. I mean, gosh, like when do you sleep, oh, man? You know, I sleep for about three to four hours a day. <laughs> really late yeah. time is all the time me and my wife have to like connect. So right. we'll like, we'll shoot ourselves in the foot and be like, all right, we're going to get four hours of sleep tonight. Let's just chill, watch some Netflix. But you know, you make time for it and not a lot right. of sleep, but you, you do what you got to do. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, and so nowadays you're fully on uh, 710 ESPN sports radio. Mm -hmm. Um, and you also do stuff with Q13. Is that correct? Yeah. So, um, so now 710 is now Seattle sports station is no longer 710 ESPN, which oh, okay. is weird to say. Uh, so yeah, I do I'm like 15 hours there during the week. I got my own podcast. Q13, I'll do like random hits throughout the week. I don't really have like a set role with Q13. Mm -hmm, They'll just right. hit me up and say, hey, did you hear about Deshaun Watson? You got some thoughts? And then <clears throat> I'll tell them what, you know, what just I think about on. the situation. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> Pac-12 Network, I do some Pac-12 Network stuff and uh, just run the business with the wife, man. And you also do stuff with the Seahawks, right? Yeah, so I'm the lead um, host for the radio pre-halftime and post-game show. So if you listen to the Seahawks games prior to the game I'll be on, um, when the game comes on, Steve Rabel and Dave Wyman take over. And then yeah. after the show, I'm back on with the squad. Gotcha, man. That's awesome. And so I want to work back. And so th that's what you do today. But back in the day, you were a kid from, was it Culver City, California? Culver City. That's right, so, right outside of LA, right? So the airport is like five miles away from it. You mm -hmm. cross one light, you can be in LA real quick. It's like, I call Culver City, it's like in the middle of everything. Yeah. Like you go north, you're in Hollywood. 
you go northeast, you're in Beverly Hills. You go east, you're in LA. You go south, you're like uh, Orange County. So it's like it's like right oh, in the middle, literally in the middle of, in the middle of everything. Yeah. And so, how was it like growing up? Was it was it a rough neighborhood? I'm not familiar with Culver City. No, nah, man. Like, yeah, Culver City is four to six blocks of good areas. A couple yeah. bad blocks sprinkled in there. You know where not to go. Braddock mm-hmm. Avenue was the big, the big block where where things kind of went down there but now for the most part man if you want to get in trouble there's trouble out there for you but if you want to walk a straight line you can do that too and you yeah. were a pretty good kid then growing up you said yeah man you know i experimented you know like yeah. i <laughs> i remember i stole once from target you know my buddy got caught that set me straight i'm like no nah, i'm yeah. not selling from target no more <laughs> didn't hang out with, with gangs or nothing like that our sports kept me in line i think that's my mom her whole goal was you know single mom raising a kid in la how do you yeah. keep them straight? I played a sport every single season. There was no off season growing Damn. up. Was yeah. football always your favorite sport growing up? It was my favorite, but my mom didn't allow me to play until oh, wow. ninth grade. So I Ooh. would have to play. I played soccer, basketball, baseball. Um, I actually snuck out and I played in three flag football games. She didn't know about it. Uh, oh, wow. Um, Cause she just didn't want me to get hurt. She was so scared I was going to get hurt. Yeah. So I snuck out. I played in three flag football games, but that's about it. You never got hurt playing like soccer or any of the other sports well, you let you play. Soccer, I broke my collarbone. Yeah, I was gonna oh, say, yeah. you know, and yeah. uh, but she, there was this, you know, football just looks so much more violent. Yeah, and people don't realize, yeah. man, you can tear an ACL in soccer, you could break a collarbone in soccer as well. But just the whole, I guess, visual of me playing football scared her. So and not tackling ninth other grade. kids. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about ninth grade. Your first year officially on a team. Yeah. What was that like? It was dope, man. Yeah. I um. So that summer, I was in England. I played on a soccer team. We traveled to England that summer. Oh, wow. wow. So football practice was already going. And I told, I didn't tell my mom that I was going to go try out. So I land from England. I swear, like two days later, I go out and I try out for the football team without her knowing. I tell her, I'm just going to go hang out with my boys or something. And I go out there. I make the team. And um, I make it as a quarterback. And I show up with my pads. And she's like, what the hell are you doing? I said, Mom, you said ninth grade. Yeah. I can play. So, <laughs> boom, here are the pads. But it was good, man. Football yeah. is um, it's a, it's a demanding sport. And you, you yeah. question yourself real quick if you really want to do this or not. What yeah. drove you to go into football versus soccer? Was it just the fact that your mom didn't like it mm-hmm. and you kind of wanted to rebel a little bit? Or, or did you just have more passion doing it? Nah, you know what? I think it was... And I'm going through this with my son right now, little Michael. Mm. Um, for me, it was I was more allowed to be myself, I felt like, in football. Mm. To where soccer culturally, you know what I'm saying, like all my boys are Latin or they're white yeah. dudes. And I didn't know it at the time when I was feeling, but I was just talking to my wife about this with my son. Yeah. I asked him, I go, why do you like football over soccer right now? He goes, oh, I just like the swag. You know, I like, and I tell yeah. her, I'm like, he's just, he feels like he's able to be himself. So that's what I felt like in football was, um, I could just be me mm-hmm. and, and you get more love Friday nights in high school. Like there was like 10 yeah. people at our soccer games, you know right. what I mean? Like, the bigger I, crowds. Yeah. High school Friday nights. It was it. I played one game. And I'm like, yep, this is what I want to do. So once you started football, did you leave all the other sports behind or did you keep playing them too? No, I kept playing. I kept playing soccer until my junior year of high school. Um, gotcha. Then I kind of had to decide football. I mean, to be basketball. I stopped playing my sophomore year. Um, baseball my sophomore year. So after my sophomore year, it was just um, football and soccer. Gotcha. Man. And were you good from the beginning? How did your freshman year go? Freshman year was good, man. I, I <laughs> was quarterback. I got called up for varsity the last, wow. like, two or three games. Um, won some awards. So it just it came naturally, man. It just felt right. Yeah. Everything about it just felt good. I mean, that's a big deal. Quarterback really freshman is. year. Was it a pretty big school, too? Yeah, um, we were Division three at the time. And okay. in L.A., it's a bit different than here. The lower the division, the the better. Oh, so, gotcha. um, there's like, what, 13 divisions in where I grew up. Mm. So, we were Division three. So, we we're, we're yeah. a pretty good team. I didn't know uh-huh. what I was doing. I was just an athlete who can throw. Watch Michael Vick. You know, I'm like, <laughs> all right, let, let's do that. Inspired by him, for <laughs> yeah. sure. Um, what, so was your main experience in high school then at the quarterback position or when did you switch to, to wide receiver? So my freshman year, I was quarterback and I thought I was going to be quarterback moving forward, but we had a dude in front of me, Alex Cueva, who's still a friend to this day. He was the guy. So my sophomore, junior year, I played receiver. And then my senior year, I played quarterback again. Gotcha. Mm. Yeah. So who recruited you the hardest out of high school? Man, my first, my first offer was from Oregon State. I was in uh, 10th grade, and my cousin had played there, um, Larry Bumpus. He played, like, in the early 90s. So as soon as I had the scene, 
they jumped on it. Oregon State was recruiting me really tough. But all, all the Pac-10 schools at the time, when it yeah. wasn't 12, so Pac-10 schools recruited me tough. Um, down south, LSU was the only school who kind of went at me tough because my dad lives in Louisiana. Mm. And uh, I told them if I were to go down south, it would be Louisiana State. So that's when Nick Saban was there. So they were only pretty tough, man. And recruiting, once you kind of narrow down your top 20 and you yeah. let it be known, okay, these are my 20, then schools just kind of leave you alone after that. Do you, um, Did any of them, like, uh, send you on any extravagant, like, trips to win you over? <laughs> like, what was kind of the perks that you saw? Man, uh, so you guys you guys are kind of young. Seen that movie, He Got Game? No. no Is it with it. Nick Cannon? Watch, no, nah, no, nah, Nick Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ray Allen, Ray Allen, Ray Allen. Ray Allen. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he goes on these trips, and um, they, it was pretty intense. I'm not gonna ruin it for you guys. Watch it. Yeah. It was pretty intense. So when I went on my trips, I'm thinking, okay, this is what it's going to be like, and uh, in some ways, and uh, each school kind of had their own thing. At SC, it was all about Hollywood, right? They, mm. I'm in a club I shouldn't be in. I'm like 18 years old. It's 21 over club. Mm -hmm. We're in the club hanging out. Uh, UCLA was more like frat boys, you know, just hanging out yeah. with the bros and stuff. Yeah. Um, Washington State was just madness to me. I could not believe how carefree everybody was. Because in L.A., you know, you're going out, you're still worried about certain things, who you with, who's going to be around. But I went to Wazoo, and yeah. everyone was just, like, carefree. I'm like, this is wild right here. Like, if, <laughs> if I don't go here, I want to go to a place where yeah. I don't have to worry about certain things like I did, you know, growing up in Culver City. For sure. What were the biggest selling points for you? Choosing Wazoo? Um, I wanted to play. I, I didn't yeah. want a red shirt. I mm -hmm. was ranked pretty high coming out of high school. I knew that if wherever I went to, I wanted to play. Uh, so at Wazoo, you know, they they told me, said, look, you get here, you're going to have opportunity to do it. And they were balling at the time. Three 10-win seasons. This cool. one in the Holiday holiday Bowl. Like, what years What years were these? Uh, holiday Bowl, their last Holiday Bowl was 03. So, like, from 2000 to 03, Wazoo yeah. was hot. I believe they had a Rose Bowl appearance as well. Oh, yeah. Like, they were they were doing it. Um, so, you know, plan A and B didn't fall through. I once go to LSU, I decommitted. Once go to USC. USC wanted me to wear a shirt, so I decommitted. Mm -hmm. Got to plan C. Best decision I ever made. Nice. And you were mm -hmm. able to start right away then, you said, right? Yeah, I got my first start in my third game. And oh, then wow. never looked back. And who was the coach at the time for those that aren't familiar? Coach Doba. Coach Doba. Doba. So he Doba. was the defensive coordinator on those teams I mentioned in the early 2000s. Mm. Um, and then when Price went to Alabama, he took yeah. over. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So what was that like? You land in Pullman, first day there. What was the emotions going through? Uh, man, it was wild. My first day, uh, I was sad because I left my mom. And it was just being my mom for 18 years. I left my boys. Um, I kind of felt like I was on my own. But once you get there and you get on campus and then you're in the locker room, yeah. you're talking to your dudes, you're like, all right, man, it's time to go now, man. Like, this is why I'm here. This is what I've been working for is to put on this jersey and go out to the stadium and, and prepare. Like, once you get in it, if if it doesn't click for you, you'll be gone before the season even starts because uh, it, it's a grind. But culture shock too man i never seen so many white people at one time in my life like <laughs> yeah so many i'll never forget I man that. <laughs> i'm walking on campus you know where the bookie is i don't know if it's still there now but uh the bookie over the by, old one right the old Not, one by the girls right. soccer field right yeah uh -huh. so i'm walking down that hill and i just hear a bunch of chatter blah, blah, blah. i'm like what the hell is going on yeah. and it's like rush week so the sororities and the frats are all doing their thing and i hit the corner and i tap my boy i'm like this is the most like most white people I've seen in one concentrated area <laughs> in my life, but it was it was it was love though. That's I awesome. Feel that, yeah. Um. So for those that don't know, uh, Bump went on to have a, a prolific career, and I have a video pulled up, and this might uh this might spark some uh some memories for you. Michael Bumpus had his pick up colleges, but Washington State was number one on his list. As Allison Leap tells us tonight, he is leaving more than his mark on the program. There have been a lot of great receivers at Washington State, and Michael Bumpus is among them. Well, he's in that elite group. You know, he's you know, obviously by just the sheer number of balls he's caught, uh, electricity that, that he has, the ability to make plays. Uh, he ranks right up there. Only one other receiver has caught as many balls as Bumpus. That's wow. Hugh Campbell. Both have 176 career receptions. Just one more catch, and Bumpus breaks Campbell's 45-year-old record. 
I mean, I'm not the fastest guy out here. You know, um, might be one of the quickest, but I'm not. Throwback. You know, like <laughs> Yo, how old were you there? <clears throat> That's my game. senior year. I'm 21, 20. Wow. wow. Young bump, man. What was that like for you at that young age, having cameras in front of you, people interviewing you and stuff? By by that age, I was good. My freshman year, I remember my first interview. Yeah. Oh, my God. It was the worst interview I, I mean it was like embarrassing and i was i remember doing it being all proud and then yeah. i they ran it back and i'm like that's horrible <laughs> you need to, i need to do some media training yeah, yeah. They give me some calm classes right now <laughs> but uh, by then by my senior year um it was fine you know you just get used to that stuff and that record yeah. that they were mentioning you ended up breaking it right i broke it i ended up with 197 i believe the record was 177 and i it stood for like 10 11 years but then as soon as Mike Leach got oh, there. The air raid yeah. Running backs were breaking my record. You know wow. what I'm saying? It, it, it was wild. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, we ran across that, and I just wanted to share that because uh, there's a, a big throwback right there. Yeah, it's big. Um, so at that point, you're in your senior year. Um, you, you had this uh, record already in the books. At that point, you knew you were going to the NFL, or was that still a question in your mind? I knew I was going. It was just how was I going to get in? Sure. Either going to get right. drafted or going to be a free agent. Um, so after that, what you do is you get with an agent and then they put out an evaluation. You send it to this magical machine in the NFL or whatnot. Then they send back your your draft class like where they think you're going to end up in the draft. Mm -hmm. So once I got mine back, they said like fifth through seventh. So I, I just, my agent told me to look, just prepare to not be drafted. So I went into the draft like, I know I'm going to make it to the league. It's just, how am I going right. to get there? Am I going to get drafted late or not drafted at all? So I just thought I wasn't going to get drafted and have to make a team. Gotcha. And that ended up, were you undrafted then at yep. the end of the day? Mm -hmm. So at that night, you're on draft night. Um, it goes through multiple days, right? Your name isn't called. How do you feel at that moment? Um, I feel all right. I, I think I, thankfully I went in with the right mindset, man. I yeah. didn't even watch the draft the first day. I was playing golf because I'm like, I'm not going to get drafted yeah. the first day. Sure. The second day, um, I had some people over because I knew after the draft I was going to get picked up if I didn't get picked up. Um, So I felt good because um, during the whole process, you got like yeah. four or five teams who are calling you. Like for me, it was like Atlanta, Cleveland, New England, Seahawks, and someone else just telling you yeah. like, look, hey, we're going to pick you up. We're going to pick mm -hmm. you up. Um, so I knew once the draft was over, I had options. So I was, I was excited. I'm like, all right, draft is over. Um, just get right. me in front of these coaches and I'm going to get a job. That, that was my mindset. So it wasn't like a, a sad thing. Like we were celebrating. I'm like, sure. shoot, we got a chance. Let's, let's turn yeah. up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause you saw that hope from these conversations you were yep. saying at that point, the Seahawks coach, was it Pete Carroll or was it before Pete Carroll? Was it a Jim No, Mora? we had uh, Mike Holmgren. Mike Holmgren. Mike had Holmgren his last year. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. I lucked out with that one. Legend. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got a call from Mike Holmgren? So I got a call from actually um, uh, Gilbertson, Gilby. He, he's actually a legend in Snohomish around here. His, his dad coached there and whatnot. He was the receiver mm -hmm. coach. He goes, look, um, I'm going to offer you a free agent deal. You know, think it out. Let me know what's up. And I talked to my agent and then thought about it, called him back, said, let's get it. Yeah, hey man. And so that, that started your journey right there. That's it. So over those next few months, you're training with the Seahawks or you're doing off-season training on your own? So you go in, they got something called like rookie ball or rookie camp. All yeah. the rookies go in. It's about mm. 30 of us in there. And then we kind of go through an OTA, just what a typical practice looks like. Then we, we go home and then they fly us back and then all the veterans come in for OTAs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's around like April, May, and then there's a break, and then you come back late June, August to get going again. Gotcha. Yeah. I want to ask real quick, going back a little bit, what was the difference from high school to college, and then after that, mm -hmm. what was the difference from college going to pro? Yeah, so each step, there's just an increase in speed, yeah. technique, and knowledge. Like, everyone is better. In, in high school, you, you can kind of pick on a guy. Like, all right, mm -hmm. we're going after 23 every yeah. single down. In college, you can do it just not as often. And then in the NFL, just good luck. Because even even I tell people all the time, even the dudes you guys think are garbage who have three receptions for 20 yards, that dude can ball. You put mm. him out in a park anywhere, he's going to look like a professional baller. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So from each step, it's really the game happens a lot faster. And that's where when you guys yeah. see a player like, Man, say Barry Sanders or whatever. Anybody who takes a football and makes all these grown men look silly, like that is special because yeah. on a football field, these are 
you know, like I said, this the the most concentrated eliteness that you've ever seen on a football field. It, it's it's crazy to me, and I realize that I'm um, as you get older, because when you're in it, you're just I'm I'm in here with these dudes, you yeah, know. Right. But speed, every step, speed and knowledge. Everybody's smart. Everybody can run fast. As yeah, you've gotten could, sorry, as you've gotten that. older. Um, has this, ha, have you felt the speed of the game increase even at those stages? It's stupid. It's, really? It, I mean, yeah. I'm a high school coach right now. Yeah. I'm an offensive coordinator at, at um, Eastside Catholic. Mm. And um, those kids are better than what we were growing up. And I was in high, oh, excuse me, I was an All-American. And mm -hmm. I'm looking at this kid, I'm like, dude, you're not too far from what I was when I was coming out of high right. school. And you're not even the best on this team right now. Like, Damn. these kids, because of the resources that they have, um, they you can look at a trainer from Washington to Florida and pick up on little things. Like when we were growing up, you kind of relied on your block and who you knew yeah. in your area to where these sure. kids are watching just the game develop yeah. so much better. The guys, that's why you see these young players, especially receivers in the NFL getting into the league right now and balling like mm -hmm. Justin Jefferson and all those cats because they, they're getting these reps. They got these resources It's wild. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I wanted to ask you that. Do you think like social media has had a big impact on that? Just the more inter interconnectedness. Yeah. The fact that people could see and learn from different people around the country, yep. around the world. Really. Like, could you imagine growing up? My favorite player was T.O. Right. Could mm -hmm. you imagine yeah. if I were able to communicate with T.O. Just a random kid, which is with some talent, mm -hmm. just communicate with them and get inspired by them. You know what I mean? And these kids can share their ideas and, I mean, yeah. I still train college and pro pro dudes. And the first thing I do is I go to Instagram or Twitter and I look at trainers that I like. All right, what are they doing? You know, mm -hmm. I want to learn, learn from them. I'm getting that mm -hmm. information so quick. So yeah. because they can get that information, man, they're, they're so far ahead of the game. I can't wait to see what 10 years from now, what these receivers and DBs and QBs look like. It's, it's crazy. Right. I, I want to talk about that whole process of learning a little bit more because you uh, are an owner for a, a, a training service, Elite Training Academy here in Washington. And so as you've been coaching these young players, how has like your coaching style changed? Like, have you had to like reach out to different folks and like learn from them new techniques or how has that changed for you? Well, one, as a coach, if you're not like furthering your education every single year, every chance you get, yeah. then you're done. Like mm. you have to change with the times and evolve with these kids. Have my, has my coaching changed with them? Most definitely. Like when I started coaching 12 years ago and I used to go just ham on these kids. <laughs> like, yeah. um, I'm on them because that's the way I was coached. You know, I was right. coached hard. Uh, we knew they loved us, uh, but we were just stimulated differently. Um, with these kids nowadays, you can still go hard on some, but you have to be aware of a lot more, um, with just where they are in this world and who they think they are. And they're just a lot more complicated because mm -hmm. of the same thing that's helping them is hurting them at the same time. It depends on how you look at it. It could be hurting them uh, because, you know, they're getting stimulated in all these different ways and all these emotions and feelings to where when I was coming up, you had like five emotions, you just roll with it. And, and kept it pushing, but they're a bit more complicated. So you have to change your coaching style with uh, your client and your players and stuff. So, but it makes you a better person too, man. Cause you know, if you just go hard all the time and you don't learn how to adjust your style to different type of people and ways of thinking and stuff, then, yeah, you know, you're done growing and you never want to, never want to stop growing. Right. So like when you were growing up, were you doing two a days and, and nowadays, like when you're coaching Pete, <laughs> man, <laughs> man, it is like, we used to do two days for two weeks. Yeah. Growing up, right? We got yeah. three two a days and they can't be back to back and have to be spread out. It's just it's uh -huh. different, but they know more about the body now. You sure. know, right. so you don't want to overexert it, right? Overexert it, <laughs> but I must have been overexerted like every two a day. Yeah, sure. It was just it's just different, man. It's yeah. uh, different times, but you adjust. Do you ever find yourself kind of thinking like, man, this isn't how I did it and kind of having a hard time adjusting to these new methods and I think every, every coach has to go through that. Yeah. You mm -hmm. have to because you're like, look, this is the way we did it and we were successful. Yeah. Why, why change it up? But um, the good coaches go through it and uh, they fight it for a little bit. But mm -hmm. then eventually once you, you change and you see how your team is changing, it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's tough, man, because you got to be stubborn. Stubbornness um, pushes you towards success as right. well so it's like a sure. it's a it's a balance that you got to find in there yeah it's kind of a humbling experience too right because you got to kind of swallow your pride and be like you know you know what yeah you got to trust the science i guess yeah you got to trust the science and 
just uh, educate yourself and, yeah. and whatever you find in your coaching journey, just roll with it and be true with it. Yeah. What, uh, what qualities do successful young athletes have that you've noticed in your time being a coach? The successful ones don't have to be reminded about school. I mean, I don't have yeah. to, I shouldn't be getting calls from your teachers and stuff. Now you go through a tough patch, we'll help you out. But the good ones, you don't have to worry about school. School's not an issue mm. or off the field behavior is not an issue. You're not going to worry right. about him, you know, picking on anybody in school or something like that. Um, and then just the willingness to take initiative, right? Like if you want to work out, I love when kids hit me up, coach, man, can we get, you know, you're busy this week, you know, what you got for me? Cool. I'll go out there and get it for you. But if you're waiting for someone to come pull you off the couch, mm -hmm. then it ain't gonna work. Right. These kids are, are self starters, man. And, um, they take it seriously. It's yeah. almost like a job for them. For sure. It's yeah. like leadership building, really, right? You got to yeah. instill those qualities that are going to help them not only on the field, but in their lives. Yeah, that's that's why I love football, because yeah. it, it teaches you that, man. Football, you're going to get your ass whooped, guaranteed. You're going to get your ass whooped. You're going to be on the ground. How are you going to pick yourself back up, right? You got to learn mm -hmm. a new offense, a new defense, it's like learning a new language. Can you yeah. pick that up? I got to I'm in a locker room with a dude from Texas, New York, Florida, Nebraska, Washington. Can we all still work together with all our differences and stuff? Like it, it's so much deeper than just winning football games. Yeah. And, and I'm sure it's like that with other yeah. sports, but yeah. you know, football is just dear to my soul. So it just means a lot. Yeah, no, for sure. I wanted to ask you about that too, actually. So you went on to start your own company, Elite mm -hmm. Training Academy. Um, how did you kind of learn the business side? I'm sure that right. you applied a lot of the leadership principles mm -hmm. that you learned on the field, but what was learning the business of it? And I know I, I, we talked to your wife about it yeah. a little bit, but I want to get your perspective as well. Yeah. One, thank God for my wife um, yeah. because she is the greatest support system I've ever had. And she's just jumped in this thing with me, but it's trial and error, man. Like right. we learn yeah. so much and we're still learning what seven, eight years into the game. But those first one to two to three years, man, we lost money. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like budgeting was off. Organization was off. Like it was just chaos because we're learning it because we didn't go to school for business. Mm -hmm. We're just doing this. Yep. And we got kids. So uh, that first it was just trial and error. And then once you find your process and your systems, which my wife is awesome at, at organizing that stuff, um, just going through your processes and your systems and sticking to it. Cause once you deviate off of that, yeah. then other problems start, start to pop up. So yeah, yeah. man, trial and error, trial and error. I feel that. That's yeah. a good lesson. What inspired you to start that business and, and kind of, you know, get it, get it off the ground. Yeah. Um, man, it was after I was done playing ball, I was actually working for Pepsi. Um, and this yeah. is why I, I have sympathy for people who are in tough spots cause I've yeah. been there, but, um, if you allow yourself to be there, then I just, I just don't feel for you. And mm -hmm. this is a prime example because I was done playing ball and I'm like, all right, what am I going to do? I've done this my whole life. I'm supposed to play 10 years in the league and make millions. Like what's up? Yeah. And we just need money. So I apply to Pepsi. I'm like stocking soda and selling it to stores and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I'm going through the store with my Pepsi gear on and people are stopping me. Hey, Bumpus, didn't you do that? You know, and like making a scene and stuff. But I'm like, shit, I got to do what I got to do, you know, to support my family. So I'm doing that. And the money's good. If you if you work overtime and stuff and you're young, like the, the money was was all right. But it was more just, you know, what am I doing? You know, this isn't what I want to do. Yeah, it was almost uh, a humbling experience. Yeah, 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 it was. It was. Um, so I come home one day and I, I'm already training athletes on the side, like on the weekends yeah. and stuff. And I just told Jen, I go, man, I'm done. I quit. Like this, this ain't what I'm supposed to be doing. And, uh, she didn't tell me until later how scared she was, but she was like, all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Put that strong you know, face she on. She always yeah. does. She does a great job of holding it down in the moment. And then if she got you later, be like, look, bro, you were tripping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so oh, I come home, I'm like, hey, we're, I'm done. And I'm just, we're just going to focus on building this business. And yeah. she was like, all right. And, um, like a week later, we started off in a 500 square foot loft, just getting doing one-on-ones and stuff. And then from there, just screw it. Yeah. yeah. And now you have a big ass facility and, and you're talking about opening up another one yep. and expanding too. Yeah. So that's yeah. amazing. Like, yeah. well, how big is your facility right now? Right now we're around 10,000 square feet. Damn. So from 500 to 10,000. Yeah, man. Wow. That's it was a big achievement right there. It's been a grind. It's been a grind. Right. Yeah. Man. Right.
So I wanted to ask you, going back to like the the social media and, and coaching these young people, you know, obviously social media has had a big impact on our society. I'm sure it's had an impact on recruiting as well, mm-hmm. right? How has recruiting changed? Yeah. Um, when I was coming up, so you could text whenever because text one, no one really did it. Yeah, <laughs> it was right. so hard to do. But now, like, there's certain windows where these coaches can communicate with these kids because at first it was a free for all. And coaches are just texting, texting, texting. Um, back toward back in my day, they kind of text with you had to call. Mm. Um, so um, they're limiting the opportunities to recruit now, just to make it fair for everybody, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, but so when I was coming up to recruit, like Oregon recruited me, they used to send me like a poster with like me in a in an Oregon um, uniform or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But now you know. Mm. They're sending, they're sending um, these kids with digital posters like every single week. You know what I'm saying? Like the promoting is crazy because if I if I send you this poster of this kid, right, and say I'm recruiting you, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna post it on Instagram, right? Like, hey, mm-hmm. thank you, Oregon, for the for the love, yada yada. Boom, that's promotion right there for them. Like, so there, mm. it's it's a lot more tactical in the recruiting these days for gotcha. these boys. Yeah. Huh. It's like almost trading a service almost in, in social media currency. Exactly. Take this picture. We'll send it to you. you go ahead and post that for us. That's a lot of pressure too. That you know, at that pressure. age, you're like 17, 18 years mm-hmm. old, about to make one of the biggest decisions of your life. And with all the, you know, access that these schools have to you, you know, like you said, they're just sending you these, these posters and all that. How was that like for you in that situation? Was were you pretty calm and were you kind of like, oh, okay, this is cool, or did it kind of like excite you and like? No, I think I was pretty low key, man. Yeah, I think you know it. It was, I was probably low key because I was I was cocky at the same time, at least yeah. mentally. I would, I would hope that I seem like a humble dude, but in my mind, you know, what I'm saying I'm like I'm supposed, to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was supposed to have these yeah. letters, you know, what I'm saying like I'm just doing everything I said I was going to do as a little kid, I was going to go to college. I was going to go to NFL, you know? So, yeah. um, when it was happening, I appreciated it, but, um, it just felt like this was just supposed to happen in my life. You know, I feel that. Right. have you had any athletes that have, you know, achieved their dream school that have gone on to be pros and, you know, they still keep in touch with you kind of have you as a mentor. Most of my guys are coming up right now. Oh, gotcha. like my, my first wave of kids that I had, yeah. well, like five years ago, like now these guys are in college. Um, I got a few over at Eastern right now. Oh yeah. Um, Cooper wanted... cup. Well, not you, did you, you didn't coach him, did you? Cooper cup. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. Nah. But like same school, same, same school. school. Yeah. 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 Got one at Eastern UW, Washington state. So they're, they're sprinkled out there. In the next couple of years, yeah, man, gotcha. it's going to be exciting. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure they were really happy when they got to those schools too. Right. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of my kids went to Eastern, and that's all he wants to do. Just go go to Eastern out of Adam Monroe. And uh, yeah. when he was there, or when he got the call, I was at dinner with my wife. We both started crying like little oh, babies. Man. Like that's what it's about, right there, man. Yeah. Helping if I can just help you do anything positive in your life, psh, that's a yeah. W right there. I mean, you're seeing these guys from like really young, kids, right? Man. Yeah, yeah, kids yeah. to now. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I want to go back a little bit to WSU real quick. You could maybe see, I think on this clip you guys are playing uh, UW. I want to ask you, what was your favorite uh, memory kind of while you were playing at WSU, whether it was a game or anything, any other type of memory yeah, you had at one. WSU? My favorite memory, man, I would have to say it was my my first start against Oregon. Yeah. Um, and I think it was week three or whatnot. I'm, uh, yeah, it was week three. And um, the Evergreen, the paper, right, comes oh, up yeah. to me like, hey, can we do an interview? I'm like, all right, this is my, my, my first one. And uh, they go, you know, what should we expect this, um, this week coming up? And I'm like, oh, I just want to back up all the hype I came up here with, right? And not even – when I said it, I didn't mean it the way, like, it came out, right? Oh, yeah. So oh, then yeah. the headlines were – Bump is going to back up what he said. Bye, bye, bye. I'm like, damn. So now I'm on, <laughs> I'm out here and um, it's uh, it's third down and um, I catch, we going for, we, uh, excuse me, we score and I'm in the slot for a two point conversion and they throw it to him and I catch it. Yeah. Like, All right, cool, cool. So then the, our, the next time they have the football, they punt it to us and I catch the football on a punt return and I fumble it. Boom, 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 boom. There's a flag on the play, though, so I get another chance. I'm like, all right, cool. Okay. I remember my boy, Carl Payman, he was a senior at the time. 
he got it. was like, come on, bump, let's go, bump. So they kick it to me, catch it, and I take it to the house. Oh, that was my first start. And once I did that, I'm like, all right, I feel like unstoppable. Like, yeah, like yeah. no one's gonna touch me now. That was you backed up those words. I, I backed it up, but I wasn't even trying to come at it that way. Right. But I, that <laughs> right. pressure was put on. So I'm like, all right, goodness gracious, that, it out. that next headline was probably just as good too, right? Because you did back it up. Yeah, I did back it yeah. up, but I learned a lesson. You got to be careful right. with the with the media. Yeah, even right. if it's just a little evergreen. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, we'll try to run with it uh -huh. for sure, man. What was that like walking around Wazoo, you know, maybe your your last year there? By then you'd have built, built a name for yourself. People knew you. Were you kind of like a celebrity of sorts? Did you feel like you got uh, a lot of eyes on you or were man, you kind of low-key? I feel like most athletes, you automatically have eyes on you, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and Pullman does such a good job of, you know, no one is, no one is like bigger than Pullman. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. even if you are a really dope football player, a basketball player, you're just a coog, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's how most people treat you. Obviously, you're going to have some people who are, like, more invested in sports than the others. Yeah. Than others. But, um, nah, man, it, I didn't feel that way, at that's least. That's cool. You know, it was it was real cool out there. Uh, I want to go back, and, and so um, it, at a later stage in your life, you know, you mentioned you worked for Pepsi. You went, ended up quitting that job and starting your own business. And then at some point down the line, after a couple of years, you decided to go into sports casting. Mm -hmm. How did that transition happen? Mm. Like, did you always have it in your mind? Like, yeah, I want to do something in the media or was an opportunity presented to you? No, nah, that was random. I was random. And I always think Aaron Levine for everything I do in media because he gave me a shot. He was the first one. Um, so when I got the, the head coaching job at Monroe, the Seattle Times put out um, just an article, a former Coug, Seahawk, is head coach at Monroe. So then uh, I believe it was 2015 or 2016, that Apple Cup, um, he hits me up and he goes, Hey man, I hear you're in town. You're coaching. Would you like to do post game for, um, for the apple cup? We'll try you out. I'm like, all right, cool. So I do it. I'm nervous as heck. You know what I'm saying? I get through it. Yeah. They you put know. makeup on you and yeah, stuff. They did makeup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still sweating. I got this bald head. I'm sweating. Like I was nervous. Yeah. I was nervous. Uh, I felt like later on I got into my groove. Um, but then I told my wife, I go, I don't know if they'll call me back, man. Shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I was nervous. It's like that first media, yeah. before media training, it was that first interview. As exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so then the next year they call me back and I'm like, all right, cool. You know, so I'm, I'm working on my stuff, you know, making sure I'm ready to go. Yeah. Uh, felt a lot better. So they call me back. And then the, the third time they called me back, he goes, Hey man, the Seahawks are looking for a voice. Mm. Um, there's been some shifting going over there. Would you be up for an audition? Went into the audition. And then just been grinding ever since, man. Wow, man. And yeah. so from that opportunity presented the opportunity with ESPN, which is now relabeled as something else. Yep. Um, and so that just kind of snowballed. Is that where you see your career going is more in, into media? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. You know, and uh, when I went to Wazoo, I took a lot of communication classes because I liked mm -hmm. public speaking. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Stuart Scott was a big inspiration for me. John Clayton, mm -hmm. who just passed mm -hmm. away, um, was big. So I always loved it, right? But um, when I was going through that time trying to figure out what I wanted to do, that didn't seem like an avenue. You know, there was no, right. there was no, no way for me to get into that. I just needed to yeah. make money right now. And what was I doing? Selling soda and I could train, you know what I'm saying? So let's, let's start the training business and get going. I stumbled into this, man. It's, it's crazy how blessed and lucky I've been to get all yeah. these opportunities. Right. Yeah. And so from that, I mean, you're on the Pac-12 network as well. Yep. You do um, the after Apple Cup um, segment on, on Q13. You do the Seahawks uh, post game. Pre halftime and post. Pre halftime and post. Yep. Um, I guess what what else is next in terms of the media space for you? Yeah. Are you working on something else? Yeah. So um, this year. I'm going to call my first Pac-12 game. It's only going to oh. be a spring game. So I'm going up to Wazoo spring game, April 23rd. Oh, nice. And I'm going to be the color guy. They're going to try to like give me an opportunity there and see um, if I can get into that. That's what I want to do. I want to be color call. What does that mean? Yeah. So those. color. So there's the play-by-play -play guy when, you, right. when you're watching football games. You know, it's, it's first and 10. The Seahawks are on the second yard line. They got two receivers out to the right side. Like, he's setting yeah. up the situation for you, right? Mm -hmm. Then after the play is done, the color guy comes in, Tony Romo. What I saw right there is the defense was in it too high. Uh, you know, uh, Russell Wilson looked down. He checked. Now he describes what actually happened. You know, play-by-play right. -play sets it up. The color just brings it to life for you. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And that's something you haven't done yet up to this point, or have you dabbled with it? No, so I've done that when I was with Root Sports. Um, gotcha. For, what, two or three years, I called maybe like 
eight to ten high school football games on route. Mm. Um, so I got experience there, but that's uh that's the the next move. What I'm trying to do, get into the color call. That's awesome. Well, so, so this episode is going to come out after April 23rd, but we'll make sure to put that link in the description for yeah. the, those who want to watch the replay. And then you're yeah. also working on uh, uh, an event for the community, Cleats for yeah. Cancer. Is yep. that right? Yep, yeah. Cleats for Cancer. So my buddy Derek Sparks, who went to Wazoo, he wore number five just like I did. Um, his daughter got cancer, so then he wanted to bring awareness to cancer. He started an yeah. all-star game um, that's played Martin Luther King weekend for now on. Um, and it just gives these these kids one more chance to play and get in front of schools like PLU's there. Um Simon Frazier was there, you know, D2, D3 type schools. Yeah. Um, and he passed away in November oh, from man. cancer. Wow. Um, so, you know, I was kind of his right hand man on this me and several other dudes. So once he passed, we got with his wife, Jessica Sparks and say, look, we got to keep this thing going. Um, so yeah. every year um, we're having an all-star game. Cleese versus cancer is a lot of the proceeds goes to cancer. And then we also give um, some kids on that, on the football team scholarships, like $1,500 scholarship wow. here, $2,000 there. Wow. Um, so it's all about just giving these kids one more chance to play, one more chance to impress, and then also bring, bringing awareness to cancer, which ironically and unfortunately, me and my boy passed away from uh, in November. Yeah. Right. Where's yeah. this held? Where's the event held at? Um, so last year it was at Popkini, and I think we're going to keep that thing rolling. Okay. Pop Kenny High School. And, and I when mean, is this Pop event? Stadium. Uh, Martin Luther King weekend. So we just had it okay. in January. Um, next one's next January. Next January. Okay. Yep. And they can find this. They have a uh, Instagram or, or Instagram, Twitter, cleats okay. versus cancer. Cleats, cleats versus, versus cancer. We'll make sure to yep. put that in the description too. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Well, I just want to say thank you for, for joining us on, on this episode of the NTAP potential so. podcast, Bob. Um, we've had a great conversation and for those who, want to uh know more about bump we'll have all the links uh to michael's instagram and all the the different things that he does in the description and if you want to find out more about cleats for cancer feel free to check out the description as well um and with that i want to say thank you guys for watching this episode make sure to like and subscribe to help us in the algorithm um, and catch us next week